So since there's only one of you this far, um, if someone else joins the board, I'll change the pace a little bit. Um, but yeah, thank you for being here. I'm excited to have someone to bounce this off with. Uh, we have an interesting day of art history ahead of us. Just a heads up, my, uh, since we've had the storms and power outages back and forth, my internet has been acting a little bit funky, so I've been kicked out once or twice. So if there's a pause or a weird delay, um, you can stick with me or I'll come back in to make sure the recording is finished. But just to let you know, there might be some bunkiness ahead, but I'm hoping, hoping not. Okay, so our theme question this week is how do archaeologists get funding? So think here of like your Indiana Jones or um, uh, I guess like the opening of Jurassic Park when you see the archaeologists on the scene. Who do you think is paying them for what? for what they're doing, or how are they making money out of the situation. Even if they're doing volunteering their time, we all have to eat. If you have any thoughts, Grayson, you can let me know. Oh, hello, Madison. Welcome. So I have just put the question out for this week. It's actually a little bit, a little bit more of a practical question, but who do you think is funding? archaeologists and their digs. So thinking of like the opening of a classic Jurassic Park movie, who's paying them for what they're doing? And there's no wrong answer. I'm just curious to see where you guys think the funding is coming from because it's probably the same as what other people are thinking. How does an archaeologist make money? If we're stuck, it's okay. I can guide you guys further. Ooh. Yes, sometimes they pay for it themselves, but it's also museums can pay for it. Do you guys think, when you guys think of museums today, do you think of museums as being super wealthy? Thank you for your comment, Graceland. Welcome, India. So we are right now uh, going into a little bit of an archaeology discussion this week, and I'm asking, how do archaeologists get their funding? It's a tricky question these days, but there's no wrong answer. We're just trying to, I'm just trying to see what y'all's guesses are. Um, so museums can be private or public. The, normally the public museums have more artwork present. And it's sort of a uh, tricky path in how art, uh, archaeologists get the funding for their digs because they are not cheap things to do. Normally the government or the state does not give an archaeologist funding even though the government or state owns what comes out of the dig later on. Most digs are funded through private donation, which is surprising for a lot of people. Um, that means someone normally wealthy or an organization has given money to the archaeologists. The archaeology, archaeologists had to fundraise for their endeavor. Now this is often done through universities. Universities will raise money to send their archaeologists out and then come back with research and a little bit of claim to fame for themselves. Um, but sometimes uh, it's also just private collectors and donors who are interested as well. And uh, the artwork we're going to talk about today is one of many that came that were um, obtained through interesting means. So, if everyone can come up with one question about this artwork, just type it in the chat box. It can be a super simple question or an in-depth one. So this is the piece we're looking at today. Who is it? Ooh, that's such a good question, Graceland. This is something that had to be disproven later on. 
But we are looking at the, the name of the person is actually in the title of the work um, called The Mask of Agamemnon. Who created this art piece? We don't know for sure because the artist didn't sign their name. And this is typical of the culture. Most artists didn't write their name at the bottoms of their works at that time. Um, but it is surely a uh, well-to-do artisan or artist of the area. Good question. So I'm going to type this guy's name on the board here so that y'all can see. Because when I say his name, a lot of people have a hard time of guessing how it's spelled. The Mask of Aga Mem Non. Uh, does this sound familiar to anyone, this guy? Agamemnon. Raise your hand if it does sound familiar. Depending on what pieces you're going over in English class this year or in the past, you might have heard of this guy before. Well, what culture do you think this is from? You can give me your best guess here. <laughs> when people see this piece, they don't often think this culture. They're normally kind of surprised by it. Peruvian? Yeah, I can see that. It's not Peruvian, though, but I definitely see where you're going, coming from, Graceland. Madison, do you have any guesses? It always kind of sticks out at this period. China. <laughs> Actually, I would say in between you two, <laughs> kind of literally. Uh, we are looking at ancient Greece right here in an era called or as a place, I'm sorry, not, and an era called Mycenae. So ancient Greece, and I'll, I'll start out, I guess we'll get started on the T. Put on my video camera. So I have some tea about this piece. Now I'm lying today, this is in fact coffee. <laughs> I think I had coffee last time too. I'm kind of slow going today for me, so I needed a little a little pick me up. So I got myself some caffeine. Um, so we're looking at the Mask of Agamemnon, and this is from ancient Greece. So modern day Greece, what we think about, or um, modern, the Greek time period, the height of Greek time period, lasted for uh, almost 2,000 years that we're thinking of. So this is an old, old work, and this is well before the height of Greece. But this is in truly from the age of legend or the era of legend. So the Greek myths that you guys uh, read about in English class. Um, can you guys remind me of those names of the myths in the chat box? It's written by Homer, is it normally your writer in the ancient world? I'll let y'all think on it for a second. But Agamemnon was a famous king, and in fact the enemy of a famous battle called the Battle of Troy. Does that sound familiar to you guys? The Trojan War? Let me, let me calm down the dog. Yes, all right, awesome. The Trojan War. Someone shut their car door across the street, and by golly, my dog has something to say about it. Um, so your Trojan War, your Trojan battle here. Agamemnon is not from Troy. He's from southern uh, Greece in the Mycenae area. So he's a king, and at this time, Greece wasn't all one country. It was a kind of a collection of kingdoms into one culture. And uh, ancient Troy was a different place in a different country. And as you guys, if you've heard about the Battle of Troy, can you guys remind me of who people were fighting over in the legend? There was, there was a person they were fighting over. A lot of women are named, yes, a lot of women are named after her. Helen of Troy, right, a legendary beauty. And as the story goes, uh, Paris of Troy, and I don't know if you guys have seen the movie, they did get this part right. Paris of Troy was out walking around, and then he was surprised by three goddesses. So 
Aphrodite, Hera, and I believe Athena all appeared before him. And they were having a fight over who's prettier, <laughs> which is just a really trivial telling of a tale. And so they had Paris choose. And Paris said, okay, well, Aphrodite is prettiest, which, you know, he probably should have never chosen. But you can't really win in any of these ancient stories <laughs> with the gods. You either choose or you don't choose, and no matter what, there's some consequence from it. And Aphrodite was happy with his choice and gave him um, one favor. She goes, what do you want? One wish in this world. He said he wanted to be married to the most beautiful woman in the whole world. But of course, he didn't stipulate that she had to be single. So Helen of Troy, uh, before she became Helen of Troy, was actually Helen of Mycenae and married to King Agamemnon. And all of a sudden, poof, his wife disappears and is told, like, is, he somehow gets the message that she's over in Troy. So what would you think as a king if your queen was all of a sudden, she just disappeared and was gone? What do you think would have happened to her in his position? Yes, she was queen mapped even. So Helen was kidnapped. Helen, as the story goes, actually ended up falling for Paris more. Uh, King Agamemnon was much older. He was probably 20 years older than Paris. So um, you can even see in the movie how they show the age discrepancy there. Um, but so he went to fight um, Paris of Troy and brought all of his soldiers with him. And then thus came the Trojan battle. And then uh, Troy didn't win the battle, though, right? Does anyone remember how uh, King Agamemnon, or not, I guess King Agamemnon's forces helped to, de to defeat Troy? They invented something that now has a name from this battle. The Trojan horse, you're right. So a crew of men snuck in at night through a gift they gave and then destroyed Troy from the inside when they were unsuspecting. So it's kind of funny to me that a lot of teams, so like my old school that I worked for, were called the Trojans. Um, and I always felt kind of bad for that as a uh, mascot because the Trojans were famous, but they weren't famous for winning. <laughs> they were skilled fighters, but they never won a battle. So I was like, it's kind of a bad luck mascot to give our teams. Anyway, so King Agamemnon, uh, we know he's from Mycenae, and that's about it. He was the king, and he was from Mycenae. Um, and the archaeologist who discovered this piece uh, took it from underground and said, this is King Agamemnon. There is no writing on the tomb to refer to that time um, that, that the king was Agamemnon. There is no legendary markers to um, prove the legends, but the archaeologist who found this brought it out and said, the uh, Trojan War exists, Mycenae exists, this is King Agamemnon. And the whole world, the whole world went crazy over this discovery. So Heinrich Schleiman um, is our archaeologist here, and he is, does not have a good name today in the archaeology world because of how he handled um, this situation. So that's why when you see this piece, it's actually called in King Agamemnon in quotes. It's because we now know that this is not the mask of Agamemnon, even though this is basically the nickname of the title that we're seeing right here. And we'll get into some of the dirty details of the Heimer Schleiman in a minute. But on the next slide here, I'm going to talk a little bit about this technique and how this mask was made. Uh, what material do you think it's made from? kind of hard to see in the image because honestly the photo quality isn't that great. It's more expensive than brass, but I can definitely see your meaning. Gold, right. This is called, uh, this is made from a uh, sheet of beaten gold in a technique called repoussé. You guys can try saying that right now. Repoussé, this is a French word for an incredibly old technique in the art world. And I'm going to put this link right here in the box. 
So this is just a two-minute video. You can skip through it as well. If you guys could do me a favor and watch this technique video of a man using repoussé, and then when you come back into this, describe what you think repoussé means, or what, how, what, what is he actually just doing to the metal to make it look the way it does. And you guys can do the same technique at home with tin foil. So we'll put on a little bit of a song. Once you guys come back in, give me a check mark um, to know that you're done. And then tell me uh, in the description box below uh, what what is Rep to say? How is how is he manipulating the gold or the metal? Awesome. Welcome back, guys. Y'all can just describe in the chat box or on the um, board what you think this technique is. It is really simple. It's like a very ancient technique of how to work with the material. It can be engraving, right? But you're, you're not like carving away the metal yet. You're sort of warping it, right? Now, I've seen students um, recreate this, as I said, with tin foil. And all you have to do is get a, a sheet of tin foil and then turn it over on the back and maybe sit it on top of a magazine or something kind of soft, like a pillow. And then you can write on the back of the tin foil. When you flip it back over, you'll feel and see the indentation, kind of like how Braille is made. You can use a hammer to carve your right. So you guys have right here, you're looking at something that's really been beaten into shape. And that's what that repoussé means, is to like beat into shape. Excellent work. Y'all are really superstars. OK. So. This is a definitely um, an intense way to immortalize your life. This is like a, a burial mask that Heinrich Schleiman pulled off of um, a skeleton in a grave. So this went actually on the face of a king. We do believe he is a king, even though not king of um, the King Agamemnon. Uh, so what are some what, like this is you know a rock star way to die at the time is to have a gold mask put on your face. What are some ways that um, you can show and immortalize your life after passing? Or maybe some people, the things that people do today. We always hear some intense stories about um, like after 
a celebrity has passed, uh, people want to be on the guest list or the list to go and see the, the funeral proceedings and things like that. Because they normally leave behind some form of spectacle to memorialize their life. We definitely still build things. And there's always these awesome articles to read about new ways <laughs> that you can buy now to, pre to prepare for your own ceremony. You know, it's kind of a grim subject, but maybe you have grandparents or something that have already made a decision on things. I know we have like a family plot of land, and my grandmother has already I think she wanted to have control over what was said about it. So she already has um, has a purchase order ready for a tombstone. And she's not even that old. She's like 77, but I'm like, geez, Nanny. <laughs> but she wants to make sure that she has complete control <laughs> about whatever ceremony happens after her passing. Ooh, yeah, you can cremate. And cremate even kind of seen as um, sometimes a quieter way of dealing with that because you don't have to take up any um, resources of the land. But there's only a ceremony after a cremation, right, and how, and how someone wants, wants their ashes to be taken care of. I can see Susan's typing too. Yeah, I've seen that too. You can turn your ashes into trees or coral reefs. You can now have your ashes blasted into space. <laughs> if you want to really, really take off, you can be an astral explorer afterwards. Um, so we have a lot invested in our culture and cultures around the world on how to uh, take care of our dead and show honor. I know that, I believe it's in Indonesia or perhaps it's another Polynesian island. Before um, some colonials came and explored, they talked about going to the houses and seeing these giant jars in the background. And in this culture, they would actually pickle their dead. So they would pour in vinegar and such for their dead. Um, this is an era in ancient history that actually isn't so bad. Like uh, we could see in the tomb that they had a family tombs at this time where the king, and then later on his son, and then later on his grandson would be buried in a similar tomb. But, you know, that'd be every you know 30 to 40 years, someone would open it up and add a new person inside. In some parts of the ancient world, if the king died, so did all of his ruling party, which is in, intense. That means if the king died in his tomb, you would find all of his like all of his wives, all of his secretaries, anyone that helped him to rule and wasn't going into power right away, had to also help them in the afterlife. And I think this is actually kind of popular in ancient Turkey, of all places, um, kind of in the crossroads. So this is a pretty good era of history to live in. <laughs> if you're working alongside the king, it means that the queen could live on as the king died. She wasn't forced to go with him. Okay, so this is a uh, a little thing we can do if you can think of some epic burial sculptures. So we leave a lot of things behind in um, markers, like grave markers and things in our world um, to show honor to those who have passed. So can you guys uh, look up an image of when I say epic, I mean, you know, the people who, who built the sculpture for them really wanted everyone to remember him or her after their passing. So we have sculptures erected often in cemeteries and things like that. If you guys want to look up an image and drop it right here, some good examples of that. I'm just spend a few minutes on this. We're doing great on time. I'll look up one too. There's actually one in my town that I live in right now that's legendary. We actually have a pretty legendary cemetery, believe it or not, called Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond City. And I lived in a neighborhood that was right next to it, so I could like walk in it 
every day if I wanted to. I normally didn't want to. I actually have a friend who lives in a house inside the cemetery, which I would never want to do. I'm a little bit too cautious of a person for that kind of, those kind of vibes. Okay. So once you find an image, just load it up. You should hit the load content button at the top. And you can upload any saved image. And I'm going to put one in here. Should be it. And then I'll give you an option to import as an individual image or place image on current page. You want to do the place image on current page. So this is from Hollywood Cemetery in Richmond City. And it's actually a pyramid. That's erected, and this is erected for um, Civil War. Yeah, sure, do too. I love it. So this, you know, this is made right after the Civil War, in which Richmond City was, um, uh, you know, the hub was was once the capital of the Confederate um, for a while. But Richmond City had a lot of Civil War uh, reactions, and so there was a pyramid built shortly after it, actually. And it might take a minute for us to upload and for everyone to see. Once I see y'all, I'll let you know. Yeah, I think the pyramid is about, you can see a car over to the left of that tree next to it. I think the pyramid is three or four stories tall. Ooh, yes. One of these sweeping angels that we see. Yeah, and this is, this is a legitimate industry to look into as a sculptor, believe it or not, because um, anything that connects with, you know, parts of life. For example, if you want to be a doctor, you know, you will always find profit in the medical industry because people always need different medicines. But one thing you can always depend on is birth. People will always be having children. So you can definitely uh, be a doctor in that. In the same way as a sculptor, there's people will always pass. Ooh, nice. Look at that piece. We have a screen cap over here. Very cool. Is that a Louise Nevelson spider? Or Louise, Louise Bourgeois? I get their names so mixed up and I really shouldn't. There's actually a famous artist who works with these gnarly spidery sculptures. And uh, she had a lot going on in terms of what she thought it meant. Uh, she actually said it always related to her and her relationship with her mother, which was not positive. <laughs> saw her as an overbearing spider literally looming above her. Um, but that's what I think of now when I see these giant spider sculptures. She really was kind of um, a huge creator in those. Cool. You guys get the idea. We have some pretty intense ways to memorialize our lives after death. So a little bit of uh, museum acquisitions. I have an ethical question for here for, here for you guys. And this relates to how some of these works have been found in the past. Next time you go and look around a museum, look closely at the terminology of how something was acquired. Well, these days, a lot of museums use the word acquire or acquisition because uh, sometimes things were donated to them and everything was uh, smooth and legal and there were no issues. But some of the ancient works that have been unearthed over time were not done so ethically. So Heinrich Schliemann is actually one of those people, the man who found the mask of Agamemnon, who was not ethical. He was actually not a professional archaeologist. I believe he was a salesman by day, and he was like a passionate reader of the Odyssey and the Iliad and believed all the places in the Odyssey and Iliad were real places that he just had to dig up and find. Uh, the cool thing about him was with his passion and determination, he actually found ancient Mycenae, and he actually found ancient Troy. So he proved that Troy was real, um, which was amazing. The whole world was just so surprised that he found this ancient city. 
He just did that by digging. Um, hello, Lyric. So, um, Heinrich Schliemann, who found these ancient works, uh, didn't do it the right way, though. He didn't get any permission, so he was digging up on public and private land. When he found artifacts, he didn't give them to the state which legally owned the artifacts. Today, in Britain, for example, if you are to um, use a metal detector and dig down several feet and find some ancient gold, you can't keep it. You have to give it over to, to British authority or risk uh, going to jail. Now, the U.S. has different policy. You can use a metal detector and dig up on private land. You just have to get approval from a, uh, the private citizen. But in Britain, you actually can be incarcer incarcerated for uh, not turning over what you found. And that's true for all of, um, actually most of the world, because it talks about our genetic history. Like this is a shared history and should be handed over to the state for everyone to enjoy. Heinrich Schliemann didn't do that. This right here is his 16-year-old bride. So at this time, Heinrich Schliemann was about 45, and he married a 16-year-old girl from a Greek island, and he was fairly wealthy, and he was obsessed with Troy and the Battle of Troy, and he dug up these ancient relics, these jewels that you see her wearing right here, and he had her put them on to make her his um, Trojan princess, is what he called her. So he was whoo, way unethical, definitely not allowed to do. Like even if, uh, to, you know, based on how old some, art, some uh, pieces are in England today, the Queen of England has to get permission to wear certain jewels, even though they're in her family history because they are so ancient and old. Normally they're just put on display because they get so fragile. So the jewels that you see here that he dug up are actually a part of what's called our common history. It should not be owned by one person, but he didn't care. He outright took things, and then he sold them to museums for a pretty high rate. And the reason why he's also looked down on today was he used his, um, he used his influence to basically get money and often outright lied. So this same uh, man here went to the ancient city of Jericho, our oldest, our oldest uh, living town in the world, and he saw a flood line on the wall and said this proves that the great flood actually happened. And he went out to all religious institutions and got a whole bunch of funding for saying these same things, even though we know now that the, the timeline doesn't match up. Not to say that the Great Flood didn't happen, um, it's just to say that he saw a flood line in a city that is likely to flood because it's right next to a river, and said something without any scientific evidence. Um, so later on, obviously, archaeologists are upset because there's actually more city down below Jericho. There's an older and older part of the city that he didn't even examine. So he was not a scientist in terms of the approaches here. So my, you know, all of this leads to my ethical question. Heinrich Schliemann stole things from Turkey, which is where Troy is today. Or, yeah, that's where they found the ancient site of Troy. And he sold them to museums and private collectors. And this was back in like the 20s and 30s, 1920s and 30s. <laughs> So it's been almost 100 years since then. And for almost 100 years, Turkey has been fighting to have those things returned because they were illegally sold and, and dug up. Um, my question is, do you think modern day museums should pay for the decisions of our ancestors? Meaning that these deals were made almost 100 years ago, long before any of us in our modern day ethics ever existed, do you think that they should be returned? Even though no one in the museum industry today um, uh, did made that deal. And this is a tricky question. So they're kind of 
of the things, the kind of stuff that Heinrich Schliemann got away with, like he would have been jailed pretty quickly. If, in modern day today, he would have been sued out the wazoo. He would have been, he would, could have not done these modern day practices, or these, these practices in modern day. Mm. So you can at least notice them. I think you're are you probably still finishing that thought. <laughs> I guess it. And if you find this question difficult to answer, keep in mind that the entire art world is, fi is finding it very difficult to answer too. So it's a pretty higher level question of who owns what at this point. And we're facing this in the U.S. all the time as well with our Native American history. There were um, lots of artifacts that were stolen from Native American tribes and sold to private collectors, often actually overseas, believe it or not. Britain was pretty obsessed with um, collecting Native American relics. And some of these were skulls and ceremonial artifacts that were taken in that the ceremonial, the ceremony couldn't be completed um, without the artifact. And also, like, um, they literally have, like, your ancestor skull on display in a museum, like a, a modern <laughs> ancestor. And so they've had to make some deals, right? One deal is, I think there's like a museum in Montana that, yeah, you can't fault other people for what someone did almost 100 years ago, right? And the huge question is, how do we even rectify it? We would be innocent in the matter. Yet we're still taking profit off of it too, right? Um, so there's, a couple, there's been some deals, as I said, that were being made. So for example, um, a ceremonial artifact that was taken from a Native American tribe that still wants to use that artifact for, in order to complete a ceremony, uh, one process that they'll do is essentially do a checkout system and become the deal. Um, not, it's a compromise. So basically, the museum holds onto the artifact until the tribe or nation needs it. And then the tribe or nation will check it out or have it shipped back to them, and they can use it in ceremony and then send it back. Which, you know, basically it, it works, but it also, like, no one comes out in the better of the situation. It's truly like a, a kind of negative compromise. No one's completely happy. And, you know, as I said, too, like, there have been some crazy things, especially around the Civil War era and going out west and west for expansion in which we actually have like pretty modern bones and relics on display in some museums, which could be, you know, which is actually, it's, it's come up to, um, it's been an issue made because their uh, children or grandchildren want those bones back to bury and stuff, but they can't get them because they were taken. Uh, so we have, whew, a lot of things going on here in this uh, moral conundrum as to who owns what, even if something was taken wrong in the beginning. Should we rectify it now? And this is, I think, something that we're dealing with in the U.S. a lot, too. Whew. Okay. So that's a lot of talking for me today. I haven't talked that much in a while. <laughs> How can we describe the style or process of this artwork? So looking back again at the Mask of Agamemnon, that gold beaten face. Let's see. Um, let's have Graceland, can you describe the process that uh, the way in which that video that you watched, um, what it, how we describe how that repoussé was created? And then Madison, could you describe the style? So 
remember, these are just a few key words to remember how it looked. If you had to describe this piece a little bit to someone, it's clearly made with fancy materials, but it's kind of crude at the same time. Thanks, guys. It was actually gold, believe it or not. But the video you watched was copper. Copper is a really common material to use. You'll find it a lot, actually, these days. If you want to get something that looks like gold, it's normally a painted copper that you can get from the craft store if you want to use something like that. Because most people can't afford to get a sheet of gold. It's very expensive. <laughs> If you decide to go to art school and get a degree in crafts, um, which is a legitimate degree, you learn like um, goldsmithing and glassworking and ceramics and stuff um, with a craft degree. And you can normally come out with a straight up art business as soon as you graduate. Um, if you go to that, they'll, they'll teach you how to use gold and sheets of gold as well. I had many friends with that degree, and they all said that the goldsmithing class was the most expensive. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely heat the metal in the record day process. But no matter what, you still have to use a hammer to beat it. And at this time, too, they would actually carve into wood and make a wooden design first sometimes. And this is a really good idea if you want to make a lot of something. So like in this area, you have a lot of cups and silverware and things like that, or plates that were using the same mold over and over again. So for the process, she's talking about the video, the style you're talking about, the artwork. Yeah, it was gold, the human face. Yeah, you got it. I think you guys got it. So I'm going to move on in three, two, one. All right, we haven't, we haven't met in a couple of weeks. But if you guys can tell me some basics right here of how they're similar and how they're different, there actually there's lots of similarities here. In terms of the differences, definitely I would think time, uh, place, and material. It's more of the physical things. And these still have to be complete sentences. I'm fine with bullet points. I turn off that notification. Definitely more defined features for sure. And there is a lot of cultural overlap between ancient Greece and ancient Egypt too. And then the Romans came along <laughs> and took over both. I believe we'll get into that one next week though. We got a lot, I got lots of feelings about Rome. I love ancient Rome. Um, but and like a lot of our modern modern things are based off of ancient Rome, but they truly started to use culture and power and engineering in different ways compared to the rest of the ancient world for good and for bad. They both have human like features, and they both I would say the one thing that's missing from there they were both made to commemorate someone's life after death. They wanted to be seen after their death. You know. Nefertiti would be locked up forever, only to ever be seen by the gods, um, in theory. <laughs> Even though we definitely have found the remains now. Um, what's interesting about Nefertiti's tomb is that they, we know that there was like two bodies in there now, that we know one of them has to be Nefertiti, but we can't tell who. <laughs> Which is kind of a funny thing. And Mask of Agamemnon, you know, once again, Agamemnon should be in quotes 
um, because we there is a, definitely a king in there, but it's not Agamemnon. Good job, guys. Compare and contrast, you got it down. Okay, so how do you think a gold mask can affect the art world? What what do you think? How yeah, words. Um, how can using this technique in these materials to commemorate someone's life kind of set a trend in motion? And I get, and this tomb is um, a public tomb too, so meaning that it would be open for people to walk in and bury the next king and the next king. It was a private tomb. So he would be seen, this mask would be seen after his death. Influence. Oh yeah, legacy, for sure. Good word. So much of our art is actually all about legacy and power, right? Do you think that the king would be wealthy in life if he can afford a solid gold burial mask? Yeah, that's totally purposeful too. Even if times were rough, or were rough and there was sickness and famine, the king still wants to be remembered as having a, doing good at his job during his lifetime. And we see that too with people in power today, with presidents and things like that. Um, no matter what controversy happened during their power, uh, you have like 10 or 15 years later, it's like people start to forget about it. And then they start to make testaments to the good times and stuff. So we definitely try to control our memory, influence people to create unique art pieces to commemorate some of That's totally true. And as I said, you'll always still find money when it comes to commemorating someone. If you were interested in this as a career, a lot of if you want to be a painter even, people will pay for you to paint a picture, even from a photo, of their great grandmother who might have passed when they were a child, right? I remember getting a lot of uh, my early jobs as a painter and things like that. And they just want to have a memory, a good time remembered. Okay. And then our review slide here. How does this impact you in your own work? Yeah, we have a lot of things we can think here. We can think about like maybe you'll look a little bit more at the little signs when you go to a museum. Maybe you'll consider a you know a different commercial aspect of the career. Maybe you'll try working with foil or gold or something that looks like gold. I'd be surprised if you guys can afford gold. You might. <laughs> awesome. Love it. Do you want to leave a legacy? Yes. I love it, guys. Gives you more ideas on how to make something realistic, and you want to leave a legacy behind. Don't we all? I feel like we all have that, especially in high school, too. Um, at least in brick and mortar, I know my senior students, kind of about halfway through their senior year, they talked a lot about wanting to leave a project that can stay. Mm hmm You guys got it. I like to see y'all thinking all the way around on this one, too. And I go to the last slide. Do, do, do. Okay. So how do people show their wealth in life? Do we still use precious materials? I feel like this is an obvious question. <laughs> And before you leave, I will tell you about this super old school story. Now, when I was in middle and beginning of high school, I took Latin, which I wish y'all had here. 
um, it was a really great course to take. So there's this famous painting, which I'm looking up as I speak, about a woman from ancient Rome named Cornelia. So this is a um, painting made much later. This is made in like the 1700s, so well past ancient Rome, but it's kind of commemorating this time period. I'm going to upload it in here. So Cornelia, um, back in the old, back in ancient Rome, uh, the first daughter was always named after her father's last name. So her dad was named Gaius Cornelius, and thus his first daughter is named Cornelia. I'm going to put this image right here in the center. Um, and after that, if you had multiple daughters or children, you just started to literally number them off. So um, I believe if he had a second, his second child was a daughter, he would name it Dua in like for two and to start counting kids off one by one. So you were only unique if you were a firstborn. <laughs> um, other than that, you were numbered, which is not so, not so nice. <laughs> but Cornelia, you can see here, is standing, uh, holding her children's hand and looking out. And as the story goes, uh, her friend here is sitting and wearing all her beautiful jewels because back in the olden times, women always showed their wealth not by wearing one of their jewels, but all of their necklaces and rings every day. So you showed people how expensive, how wealthy you were. You even like would put the jewels in your hair, um, things like that. Her friend, as the story goes, is talking about all the beautiful jewels that she's wearing and how and how, why doesn't Cornelia wear any jewels? Is her, isn't her husband a senator? Cornelia holds out her arm and points to all her children and says, these are my jewels. <laughs> Which was, oh, like, actually counter-cultural story for ancient Rome, but the legend still, con you know, came, exists today even. You still hear this story. And uh, it was a big story used in the 1700s normally to criticize the royal families and the wealthy people who were um, uh, misusing their power and just spending a whole lot of money on jewelry and such. So, you know, we have this culture of humility in our own country, but do you still think people show their wealth in life, like Cornelia's friend? Or that we're more focused on being humble than people see us? I'm kind of divided here with this question, too. I have like two responses, but I want to hear your thoughts. How do people show their money today if they have to, if they want to? We definitely wear expensive clothes, you know, where the name brand's really big. We could be famous people not go over the top of Versace and Gucci, right? Some people definitely do go over the top, but you normally see those people on TV, <laughs> right? Like trying to make that there. Or now with our social media culture, even, people are tagging brands and things like that. But some people still hide it, for sure. There's a good documentary on the millionaires in America because uh, we used to have the highest concentration of millionaires. Now uh, China does. And in this documentary, they were going through and saying like how people became millionaires. And hands down, almost everyone was like, I just became a millionaire by not spending money, <laughs> by saving as much as possible. So these people were like super penny pinchers and stuff where they wore all their clothes secondhand. Um, one guy even was, he's a millionaire, right? He's incredibly wealthy. But when he goes out to a restaurant, he goes around to every table and asks for their leftovers and has them all boxed up 
right? Pretty nuts, but he's like, it's cheaper than trying to buy food, which I guess is true, but also, like, a very difficult thing to pull off if you don't have a, if you don't have a lot of power. <laughs> anyway, so, yeah, I would say, you know, we're kind of divided here in our culture today. People definitely show it, but we often don't go over the top either. Whew, we certainly don't wear all of our money on us. <laughs> But thanks, guys, so much. And Graceland and Madison, you guys are such troopers. It's really wonderful to have both of you here and have people to bounce ideas off of with. And y'all are both such in-depth thinkers as well. I just wanted to know that I see you and I'm thankful for you being here at this class. Let me turn off the recording now.